Uh, thank you so much for that beautiful music. I did make that request for a very good reason and for the purpose that the presentation that I wanted to make is somewhat related to that. I want to first and foremost say I'm so thankful for you coming here for 10 days. I'm thankful for all the speakers that flew into the country for also this period of time. God in heaven understood things that we didn't understand many months ago. And I'm so thankful for Pastor Allen and for Brother Anthony, whom the Lord sent just in time. They stand beside the man servant whom we had invited to speak the word of God. Because if anything, the last thing that I would have thought of was that Mr. Daniel would miss. And why? Because I knew it had been possible for him to be here many times. So it would be a challenge to another person, but not him. God saw that many months before we saw it and said, I will send other messengers to minister. I mean, Pastor Allen sends me a message and tells me that, would you have someone to speak on health? And that time we were weighed down because we had already slaughtered Brother Weekly to speak on health. And you all know how Brother Wycliffe has been engaged. And when we heard that, we just said, praise the Lord. Because God understood the burden. And God already sorted us out before we thought about it. And God has ministered to us in this camp meeting in a special way. And so when I thought about what to say as a final word, as a minister... And as a coordinator for this camp meeting, I said, God, I don't want to say anything about myself or about any person who has been involved. I want to direct your people to you and to your presence. Why am I saying that? We have studied for 10 days and we have learned so many things including doctrine and lifestyle and Christian standards. We've just learned so much of what God wants us to do. But in the month of August, after camp meeting, which I did somewhere, I began looking into the subject of the sanctuary, but from a different light. And this probably is what I want to share with you as the final thought and the final message after such a solemn message from our pastor about time. Let's pray. Flesh and blood protect nothing. The words that you speak to us in spirit and their life. And so I pray that you speak to us one more time in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You see, probably I've been to your church presenting a message on the sanctuary. And when you look at the sanctuary, all of us think about the first five books of the Bible. And that is very true because the first five books of the Bible paint the picture of the sanctuary, especially the real sanctuary in heaven. The truth is the first five books of the Bible are a ritual, or rather a pictorial demonstration 
of the real sanctuary. It's beautiful that we should study the sanctuary from the prototype that God has given us. But it is even more beautiful to see the reality and the experience that is gained by those who come to a knowledge of the sanctuary. I have come to realize that the longest book in the Bible is the book of Psalm. And the book of Psalm is not written by one person. It's written by many writers. I am here to submit to you that those who wrote the book of Psalm themselves were psalmists, poets, or singers. They are involved in music, and music is an intense part of way in the sanctuary. It was so important that one of the leaders does write out the book of Psalms and he says, If God so blue boy for me or some, that he ensured that the life portion of the scripture would actually be some. How much more should we, living in the last day, follow the book of Psalms? Knowledge the book of Psalms is written by men and women. Who are rating an experience they had with God, an experience they had when they least needed God. And that's why he sang the song of letters in the song, Burdens are lifted at Calvary. You see, the book of Psalms is an experience that is gained by those who have studied rituals, by those who have studied the future. And by those who studied the pattern of the sanctuary in the first books of the Bible. So when David and Asaph and Moses and all these people come to the book of Psalm, they reveal or express what they received in studying the sanctuary, what received by going into the sanctuary. The doctrine of the sanctuary is more than just a doctrine. It is an experience. That the end time people of God, Seventh day Adventists, must have in order to go through the final days of this world history. The sanctuary is the central beat of the Bible. The sanctuary, let me say it this way the Bible explains the sanctuary. The Bible is of the sanctuary. Because there is so much in the plan of salvation that we may not comprehend now. And in the book of education, we are admonished and told that there is so much in education, or rather in the plan of salvation, that only eternity will reveal to us. Helen White says to us that around the sanctuary and its solemn services, mystically gathered the grand truths which were to be developed through succeeding generations. And that's why it says that actually it is the third angel's message that entered with the Seventh-day Adventist movement into the sanctuary. And in the most holy place, they were able to see a comprehensive, holistic nature of the Bible truths that would lead a remnant movement into sounding the love cry. You know what, friends, in a picture of the sanctuary, it's interesting that the sanctuary was the central uh, structure. I mean, it's to the center, or I mean, at the very central point in the camp of the Israel. And there is a reason. And this is where I, I begin to demonstrate what I wanted to show you and leave you to go with all. We need to come together to finish the work of God. But you know what's happening is that those who came to the sanctuary, the sanctuary became the central point where all the tribes of Israel met. It was put so much in a way that it was accessible to every sinner. Every man who chose Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, were all led into the sanctuary, and in the sanctuary they met. The sanctuary is the doctrine that can bind us together. And if we realize now the sanctuary and why God gave the seventh day advent is the sanctuary, that through the sanctuary, if we realize Jesus as the sin pardoning Savior and we take the lamb, where do we lead? I mean, where do we go with the lamb that we've taken? We head to the sanctuary. And at the sanctuary, at the altar, 
all sinners met there that if the spirit of Christ be in you and the spirit of Christ be in me, then we will be bound together. We will be drawn close to one another. The sanctuary was at the center, not just of worship of, or rather the economy of the Israelites, but also literally in the center of the tribes of Israel. The sanctuary was the ultimate, or rather the ultimate meaning of the sanctuary was to be a personal communion with God on the sanctuary, in the sanctuary. It was an emblem of separation from sin. And why is that? Because all who entered in the sanctuary went into the sanctuary with one purpose, and that purpose was to pass over their sin to the sin bearer, into the sanctuary, into the veil, waiting for the final atonement, which is the blotting out of sin. And it's our sin that has separated us from the sin. A sanctuary was not just a place where men went because they're all burdened by sin. A sanctuary was a place of refuge for the saints and children of God. I want you to understand that point because I will be labor on that point to show you that we will be leaving this point at this place. And I, I have shared with a few of us. We are going through diverse trials and temptations. Ellen White says the gospel is the ultimate solution to all the world's problems. There is nothing that can solve our problems. There is nothing that can solve the mess in the government's problems. There is nothing that can solve the problems in the church. There's nothing that can solve disunion and disagreement and problems in our marriages and homes. The gospel only can. The gospel is the ultimate solution to all trials, troubles, or difficulties that we are going through. The sanctuary is a place to behold the goodness of God, his truth, and his beauty. So when those who go into the sanctuary, they see the truth as it is, because the sanctuary is an emblem of truth. The sanctuary is a place of refuge, but in the sanctuary we also see the beauty of God and the goodness of God. You see, when the Bible says in chapter 25, verse 8, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst, God understood in a deeper sense what Paul would now say, Christ in you the hope of glory. Because God wanted to come close to his people, but the problem was sin. And the only way God could come to his people or come close to his people, lift his people close to himself, was by a removal of sin. And the sanctuary was an emblem, something that would demonstrate to the Israelites and us, who are the end-time Israelites, how sin can be removed from our midst. God wants to reside with his people and have intimate fellowship with them. The sanctuary doctrine is the unfolding of the Emmanuel experience embodied in Jesus Christ. And I've said this before, that you see if today we live in a time that someone rose perhaps in the governments of this world and burnt all the Bibles that existed today, then the question would be, would there still be Bibles read? Well, if we are true Christians, we should not be worried about what? Because Jesus Christ was the word of God made flesh. Now, there is a theological understanding of that, but there is also an experiential understanding of that. And what is that? That if there was no Bible, the life of Jesus Christ was a demonstration of what the word of God was teaching to the left. The life of Jesus Christ, if you never opened the black book, would demonstrate to you what is, what is in Genesis all the way to Revelation. And that is why Paul says that we are to be living epistles read of all men. Friends of Jesus, I want us to understand that the sanctuary doctrine is the unfolding of the Emmanuel experience embodied in Jesus Christ. Psalms 27 verses number 1 all the way to the end. It's a beautiful psalm, and it is believed. I have not been to the uh, Middle East, but it is believed that the Israelites' current 
uh, do recite this verse every time of Yom Kippur. And why? Because it's believed that it is the central psalm of the sanctuary. You see, David, when he experiences Psalm chapter 27 or writes Psalm chapter 27, David is being sought by one man. And what's the name of this man? Saul. Saul wants to kill David. He wants to destroy David. And David is the chosen and anointed child of God. And let me pause there and tell you right now that as you are living here, there is a soul in our lives. There is a soul outside there in the world. There is a soul in your family. There is a soul at the place of your work that is seeking to destroy you because you are the anointed and chosen child of God. There is someone that is pursuing you because of your faith. There are difficulties that you are experiencing because of the stand you have made for Jesus Christ. And Psalms chapter 27 is for you. So when David looks at the experience that he's gone through, he's the chosen one of God. And David then thinks about what to write. And then he begins to compose this poem that is beautifully compacted and put in the scripture. And he says, a psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? When David sees the Lord as his light and salvation, he says, who is it that I shall fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You know, it reminds me of a time that you were working somewhere in Kitui. And when we went there and pitched our tent there, we were in a few, a few weeks accused of killing a man, a businessman in that town. And the police came into where we were staying. And they ransacked and they checked our bags and looked and thought, Bugs, you are terrorists. And then they took me and another brother whom we were leading with this group of nine missionaries. And we went and we wrote a statement. Then we came back and then at night the police came again. But we knew that when policemen come at night, they are probably coming to arrest you. And we were with a young man and this young man told me, Zadok, we might sleep in the cells tonight. So I told him, should we run away? He said, no. Let's kneel down and pray that God may give us direction on what to do if we should go there. We knelt down and prayed. And after we had prayed, the policeman never rested. But have you come to a point where this verse makes so much sense to you because it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who then shall I fear? Who shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Oh, whom shall I be afraid? I mean, David is a shepherd. David is a boy who takes care of sheep. David is a young man. Being pursued by a king, a sovereign man, a powerful man. And David writes a psalm like this. What gives a young man that courage? And he says, when the wicked, even my enemies and my foes come upon me to do what? To eat my flesh. They stumble and fell. And then he says, though an horse should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. What was the confidence of David? Listen to verse 4. What was the confidence of David? Because when we look at the sanctuary, we see the doctrine, but do we see the experience? Then David says in verse 4, one thing have I desired of the Lord. Is it a job in a well-paying company? Is it position and power? Is it wealth and money? 
David says one thing I have decided of the Lord, and that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the sanctuary, in the house of the Lord, all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. Every single child of God must learn to be lost in the sanctuary, not just theoretically, but through experience. Every child of God, when we live here, we must be lost in the sanctuary. We must be barricaded. We must be masked in the sanctuary too. David understood what the sanctuary meant to them. In fact, I'll be able to show in a little while that the sanctuary, which is an emblem of the presence of God, to the Shekinah glory, was a place for those in need. The sanctuary was for not for those who had a laudation condition. Listen to me now. Why? Because when we are laudation, and we can become laudation. See here, right here in this building. When we are laudation, we have the feeling that we have attained. When we are laudation, we have the feeling that we have a need of nothing. When we are laudation, we reach and increase of goods. The sanctuary is not for such people. The sanctuary are for men who are seeking because David says that I will, or rather, that will I seek after. The sanctuary is for those who seek, is those who are in need, is those who are looking for something. The sanctuary is for men and women in need. If you didn't need a savior, you are not to go to the sanctuary. If you need a savior, you have to take your lamb to go to the sanctuary. And that's why now Paul painting this picture to his brethren, he says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and found grace when? And in the time of need. Where was this throne? He understood the throne to be in the sanctuary. And those who went into the sanctuary are men who needed grace and needed mercy in the hour of need. I'm here to submit to you that we are in an hour of need. We are desperately in a hour that we need power to finish the work. We are desperately in need. We are in a time when we need power to be able to overcome the beasts, his image and his mark. I don't know about you, but I'm desperately in need of the sanctifying power of Jesus Christ. You see, verse 5, he says, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. You see, why God gave the Seventh-day Adventists the sanctuary message is because he understood that they needed it for the time of Jacob's trouble. But they don't just need it theoretically. Yes, they need it. They need to understand the doctrine but then they don't need just the dog, they need the experience that comes from there because if they understood the sanctuary, they would stand through the time of Jacob's trouble. They would go through the time of the passing of the National Sunday. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secrets of his tabernacle shall he hide me. Where is it that God is going to hide his feet? In the secret of his tabernacle. And I'll show you that how, because the tabernacle literally is in heaven, but how will God hide us in the secret of his tabernacle? Look at verse 6, or rather, he shall set me up upon a rock, verse 6, and now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of war. I will sing here, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy upon me, and answer me. And verses, chapter 26, verse 5 says this. The same psalm. I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. I will wash my hands in innocency, so will I come past thine altar, O Lord, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell all thy wondrous work Verse 8 says, Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. 
gather not my soul with sinners, nor my love with the love of my life with bloody men. You see, David understood it. He understood that the sanctuary was the place to be. Done. The sanctuary was the place to make a place of his habitation. And he says in Psalms, if we go back, Psalms 27, verse 8, when thou said, Seek ye my face. You see, in chapter 8 of the book of Ezekiel, the men of Israel, the leading men of Israel, are turning their face on the world. And they are facing the sun and worshiping the sun. So we need to understand that all who turn away from sanctuary will finally worship the sun. Because when we turn away from the sanctuary, our face from the sanctuary, we cease to look at Jesus and begin to look at men in the world, begin to look at them, begin to look at the worldly idols. But when we face the sanctuary, who are we building? Jesus Christ. So that my like day says, when, when thou say, Seek my face, by asking to thee, that face, Lord, will I seek. And how do we seek the face of the Lord? The Bible says, The way of the Lord is in the sanctuary. The way of the Lord, it is in the sanctuary. And the Bible says, I am the way, the truth, and life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. See, friends, verse 9 says, I have not thy faith far from me, who taught thy son in anger. Thou hast been my help, leave me not, neither forsake me, O God, of my salvation. Verse 10, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up, teach me thy word, way. O oh Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of my enemies. You see, David understood that even family can turn away from you because of your faithfulness. And David knew that he was approaching a moment that he would walk the Lord path with God alone. And he says, if my man and my father and my family and what around me forsake me, I have a God beside me. I have Christ beside. I have angels to guide me. This is assurance we need. So one day, a man asked me, you are preaching, and I hear you trying to expose the evils of the Pope's. But if you have power like Martin Luther to just go and stand before the Pope right now, or even some priest in Nairobi. And I looked at him and I say, well, I'm not sure I can do that. But let me tell you, brothers and sisters, if we are with God and he knows that this is the right time for him to give me the power, I will fear no man. I will fear no nothing. Why? Because David says, teach me my way, O Lord, and lead me in plain paths because of my enemy. He says in another verse, look at this, that unto thee, that he may dwell in thy court. Blessed is the man. But I'm here to tell you, blessed is any movement that God leads into the sanctuary. Blessed is any family that God leads into the sanctuary. And why? Because the sanctuary is the central beam upon which all other truths are anchored. You need to understand that, friend. Blessed is the man that God causes or chooses to approach unto him that he may dwell in the courts of the Father. Going back to Psalms chapter 12, and I'll put a pictorial um, demonstration of what David is going through. And David writes from an experience of nature, the first 12 said, deliver me not unto, or rather, not over unto the will of mine enemies. Then he says, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty, and the Bible represents the devil as the earth accuser of brethren. False witnesses. 
false representation. They'll come from your friends. I mean, people are being even misrepresented on what they teach. And so you'll go outside there and people will misrepresent you and what you believe and what you teach. Here is David giving you some hope now to his experience, delivering unto all unto the will of my enemies. For false witnesses are risen up against me, and such without quality. I had fainted. Mark those words. Because I'll come back to them in some uh, in, in a in a future psalm, because he says, I had fainted. Do you know? Perhaps it's you or me. But what about you that sometimes you can faint because of false accusation? You can faint because of misrepresentation. You can faint because of the burdens that sometimes you go through and bear in your life experiences because of the truth. Do you know that sometimes you can be weighed down because of the persecutions and affliction? David says, I had fainted. But look at this. Unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, wait on Lord, be good courage, and he shall strengthen my heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. David says in a beautiful psalm, you want to read this psalm over and over again, Psalms 91. This one says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Moab, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and in him will I trust. Surely shall deliver thee from the snare of the fallen uh, and from the noisome pestilence. Psalms chapter 77, because I want to end this with these lines uh, that I hear in Psalm 77. And Psalm 73. You see, in Psalm 77, it's a psalm that is read by many people, and which verse is read many times? Verse 13. And verse 13 says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary, who is so great a God as our God. But if you check carefully, before you get to that verse, it begins by, to the chief musicians, to Jerusalem, a psalm of a psalm. It's not written by David. But this is a psalm, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave an ear unto me. Verse 2. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My soul reigned in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. Have you been in the situation of a psalm where nothing can comfort you? Well, that's what a psalm was going through. And verse 3 says, I remembered God. And was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Thou oldest my eyes waking. I am troubled that I cannot speak. And then he says, I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient time. Verse 10. And I say, this is my infirmity. But I will remember the ears of the right hand of the most high. Verse 11. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember the wonders of old. Verse 12. I will meditate also the works of all thy, uh, I will meditate of all thy work and talk of thy doing. Verse 13, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary, who is great or so great a God as our God. You know, he understood that the way to peace, the way to experiencing comfort, the way to experiencing a fulfillment I mean, a fulfilling life is in the sanctuary. Many of us here are troubled. Many of us here are wondering, what shall it be like tomorrow? Well, the brother here sang, burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Jesus is right in the sanctuary. And you know what to do? You need to follow Jesus by faith in the sanctuary. You need to study this blueprint that God gave to the Adventists. I mean, of all the messages, the sanctuary was the special message that revealed to the Advent movement the holistic nature of the truth that would lead 
to the revelation of Jesus Christ and the sounding of the loud cry. Say thy way. And the enemies knew it. And that is why every time that an enemy attacked Israel, their target was the sanctuary. Because they understood that the sanctuary was mean a meaningful thing to the Israelites. That God valued the sanctuary and Israelites valued the sanctuary. They knew the sanctuary was the presence of Jehovah. They knew that those who came into the sanctuary were coming into a closer nearness to the fact. And so whenever the enemy came, the first thing they were to attack, or the ultimate thing to be attacked, was the sanctuary. And what do you think, brothers? If they wanted to attack Adventism, they would attack the sanctuary. Because they understand that if they attack the sanctuary, the central economy of worship of Israel would be complete. If they attack the sanctuary today, the central economy of the Advent movement that is going to finish the work will be finished. We can hold any other doctrine, but if the sanctuary goes away, brothers and sisters, we will not be able to finish the work. Nebuchadnezzar understood it, and he took away the sanctuary. But you know what, brothers and sisters? When God wanted to restore Israel, that would be a representation of who he was and his message and his truth, he began by the restoration of the sanctuary. And that is why David says the work is great. Because the temple is not of man, but of the Lord. Now for the house of God, oh my God, I have prepared with all my might. I have set my affection on the house of my God. It's the affection of we as Seventh-day Adventists and as a movement that is looking to finish the work in the sanctuary. There's our affection right there. Let me give you this illustration. And I've given it to people many times. Because I think, true enough. This illustration I've given to people many times. When you come into the sanctuary, and I want you to listen to me carefully, because you are now going home. I don't know what you are going to. I don't know why you came here. But one person here wrote to me and told me, oh, brother, this was the right camp meeting. I mean, I feel that God has been able to lift my body. But I'm here sharing with you something about the sanctuary. You see, the sanctuary had curtains. The sanctuary had skin that was used for covering and all that. The sanctuary had um, angelic embroidery on it, marking the ages and all that. But I don't want to go into looking at what all this ex I mean, meant, but I want to bring to you some. In my studies, I realized that the sanctuary Covering was made of a badger skin. You see that? It was made of a badger skin. Now, I was asking myself, is this bad? And this day we were talking with Brother Anthony there, and I, we were trying to look at who is the king of the jungle. And they told me, you know what? The lion is noisy, but the cheetah, perhaps the leopard, is some dangerous animal. Every other person in the animal in the jungle will be scared. But I realize that's one thing. But it's another thing to be a small, little, tiny animal like a badger and stand in the face of a lion and a cheetah and any other animal and threaten. Let me tell you, God is not calling us because we are great. God is not calling us because we have mastery or we have money or we have wealth or because we are men. God is not calling us because there is something so special for us. I mean, God can use the least group that is faithful to him to finish the work. I mean, God used 300 faithful men to be able to do a greater work. He was not interested in thousands going with Gideon. 
and God comes into the sanctuary, and there are so many animals in the jungle, and God directs his servant Moses, gives him the pattern, and tells him, when it comes to covering the sanctuary, I want you to use an ibajaski. What is God meaning? What is God meaning? And when I began studying, I realized that the Anibaja will eat your honey no matter what protection you put. The Anibaja is not scared by bees. I understand that bees do sting Anibaja, but the badger does not feel the sting. It is covered by bees all over, and the bees think they are stinging the badger, but the badger keeps sucking the honey out of the cob. Let me ask you a question. Are trials and afflictions going to divert you from the search of truth? And all these things that these men were going through as we've read the experience of David and they're all lost in the sanctuary, are they going to discourage us? I talked to a lady who was earning fairly good money in the time of the COVID and she was stopped from work. I mean, literally, she talked to me. This lady was paid, I mean, I think over 400000 And when she called me, I was right in my, in, in my small studio in my house, and she told me, I want you to pray with me. And I asked her, what's the problem? And she told me, you know what? I have been thrown out of my job because I decided to decline the job. And she told me that there is no official communication. I have been called while I was driving to job. I was driving to work. Are all these things going to discourage you from sucking the honey, the beautiful truths that you have received in this camp meeting? When you go outside there, and you are baptized, and they tell you that you've left the remnant church, and you are now there, walking there with offshoots and men, and they can call you all names, they can call you Carl, they can call you all these things. But if you have realized that what you are sucking is on, are the bees going to distract you? The Anibaja was not distracted by the bees, and look at the Anibaja against that animal. Do you know what that animal is? That's a lioness, and the Anibaja is scaring their lioness. It is, I mean, they believe that sometimes the Anibaja will scare li lions, and lions will run away. Let me tell you something interesting, because I was reading about this and trying to find some documentary about the badger. Sometimes the lion can hold the badger. You know, the badger is small and light now. The lion can hold the badger and lift the badger up. But interesting, they have found out that the badger skin is so tough and hard, it is difficult for the lion to bite through the skin of the badger. They have also found that the badger skin is elastic. So that when, you, when the lion holds the badger, the badger is able to turn or stretch its skin and turn and bite the lion. They have also found out that the badger has teeth that is so strong than the teeth of perhaps, I don't know, maybe a warthog. I don't know. You've seen warthogs. I don't know if you've seen warthogs over there. Are there a couple number of warthogs roaming around? It's so tough. But think about the elasticity. Think about the elasticity when pain grips so close. When you are about to give up, God gives you the endurance and suffering to hold a little longer. And why? Because he says in a little while, he that is to come will come. And you need to understand for he says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my from there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But when he discussion he repeats the same thing and tells them in verse 27 listen my peace i live with you not that the world give, giveth peace give i unto you 
Let not your hearts be troubled. And he says now in chapter number 37, 10, uh, 10 verse 37, 35 to 37 of the book of Hebrews, where God now says to the Arab movement people and speaks to them so directly. And he tells them, give up not your confidence. See, that's a great recompense of reward. Don't let go the truths that God has been able to give to you. The devil can come as a lion, rat, roaring, walking about, seeking someone to devour. But I want you to understand this blessed truth that if you are even in the sanctuary, God has provided the strongest covering against every harm that the devil will direct against you. I don't care what missiles are sent against the sanctuary. Those who enter the sanctuary are barricaded one by the veil, and that veil represents the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. But above that, God has also put the ministration of his angels round about so that those who enter the sanctuary are covered by the strongest powers of heaven. Does that mean that bees will not bite them? Does that mean that lions will not hold them? But that all means they are not scared by the lion. And they are not scared by the bees. Why are we scared by the lions of this world? Why are we scared by the bees that sting us? Oh, friends, let us not be scared of all these things. This is a beautiful thing, and I heard it from Sister Sherry because she quoted this during the L. But I now quote it from another book, Science of the Times. Listen, the presence, Father's presence in cycle two. Nothing befell him but that which infinite love would do for the blessings of the world. Here is his source of comfort, and it is for us. He who is imbued with the Spirit of Christ abides in him. Whatever comes to him comes from the Savior, who surrounds him with his presence. Nothing can touch him except by the Lord's permission. All sufferings and sorrows, all our temptations and trials, all our sadness and griefs, all our persecution, or rather, and privations, in short, all things work together for the good. All experiences and circumstances are God's workmen, whereby good is brought to us. I don't have time, but let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. When they went into the sanctuary, there is something that they sort of realized. Uh, I, I mean, I just, I don't know, but you'll help me. There's something that I wanted to say in Psalms chapter 73. Uh, Psalms chapter 73. There's just something that I want to say I pray with you. You see, in Psalms chapter 73, verse 17, is a beautiful story. And this is what I'm going to say and I pray with you. Because in Psalms 73, Asaph comes back to the scene again now. And then we read verse 17, and what does it say? Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Isn't it? And it's beautiful to understand that the sanctuary is the ultimate solution to all our troubles and things that we don't understand. But let me tell you one thing. You will not understand that verse until you read it from verse 1. And that's what I want to read for you when I pray with you. Psalm 73, and verses number one, this is what it says. This is what I want to say, and then I pray with you. And we just go and have fellowship outside, and we can wait for the Sabbath to end. Psalm 73, and verses number one. Truly God is good to Israel. Even to such that are of a clean heart. But he says, but as for me... My feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. In other words, the psalm is saying, I almost backslid when I turned my face from the sanctuary and looked at the foolish, wicked men outside there. You know why many of us will be lost? 
we turn our face from the sanctuary and begin looking at people. Begin looking at the world. Begin looking at self. And the self says, you know what? I, a chief musician in the sanctuary, I almost backslid. I almost slipped off. Why? Because I looked at the people. And there he says, for there are no bonds in their death, but their strength, st their strength is far. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued or are, are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compasses them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. And you are there struggling and wondering why you can't feed your children. And you look outside there and you see men who hate God and walk against his commandment, wasting money. And you ask God why. You know, let me tell you something. As long as you keep looking at those men and you keep looking at those scenes outside the sanctuary, you are going to backslide, you are going to faint. But the moment you turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full into his wonderful face, the things of this world will grow dim and lose their value in the sight of his glory and peace. So friends, Asaf looks at the world and he says, I almost fainted. And he continues numerating, you can read it at home. For he says, like in verse 8, he says, These men, they are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak lovely. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore, his people return it and waters, or rather, of a full cup are wrung out to them. Verse 11. And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the ungod who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verse 13. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. You see now, he says, It is in vain that I've so secreted my life. It is in vain that I've given my life to God. It is in vain that I've surrendered myself to serve God. And you can get to a point where you look at yourself and you ask God, I have been in ministry all this time. Why is all this happening to me? I have consecrated myself and left everything and things don't just seem to work. What's happening? And that was the situation. He continued to look at the world, but Asaf was saved. And you know what saved Asaf? The sanctuary. And I can tell you, if your condition is like that, the sanctuary can save you today. I mean, just turn and look at the sanctuary. Just behold the sanctuary. Because he says in verses number 16 and 17, When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of Jehovah. Then I understood their end. The sanctuary shows us the end of the week. When you go to the sanctuary, I mean, you can't even struggle with the issues of God just until does not kill. You don't understand the justice of God. When you go into the sanctuary, everything falls into line. And that is why I have a message for you, my friends, that when you are in the sanctuary, look at this. When you are in the sanctuary, the sanctuary, according to chapter 96, verse 6 of Psalm, you will be all the strength and the beauty of God. They are all in his sanctuary. His strength and his beauty. You know, I want to recommend to you, brothers and sisters, the sanctuary. I want to recommend to all of you the sanctuary, the grand truth, that we have as a people. We are nearing the time of Jacob's trouble. And we'll be sought like David was sought. But if we run to the sanctuary. You know one thing that will happen. If we all decide to run into the sanctuary. We will have a central meeting point. We will meet. And we've talked here about unity and diversity. Or rather. Uh, I mean united. In one accord to finish the work. But where are we going to be in one accord? In error? We cannot be one accord in error. And where is the truth? I mean, the Bible says that the sanctuary is the truth. We run into the sanctuary. We are going to be in one accord. 
If we run into the sanctuary, we are going to behold the goodness of God. If we run into the sanctuary, we are going to find refuge. If we run into the sanctuary, we are going to see, find power and strength. If we run into the sanctuary, we are not going to be just there for anything, but listen now. We are also going to receive that cleansing and sanctification in preparation for the coming of Jesus Christ. For the sanctuary, these things, the truth, the beauty, the righteousness, the strength of God, and purification of the people of God in readiness for the coming of Jesus Christ. May God bring us back to his sanctuary as he brought his people to the sanctuary in 1844 in Jesus' name. Father in heaven, we've wandered far away from thee. We've left the sanctuary, your presence, and we've gone to the world and we are not in the protection of heavenly ministers. We want to go back. And some of us, all of us, we have no power, we have no strength. Please give us power. Please come, Lord, and help us. Our weakness, we are fragile. We just don't know how to trace our way back. We need you, Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. I'm so thankful for this camp meeting. And I'm so thankful for the messages that I have heard and we have heard. I pray that they may be spirit and life to us. And they may help us, Lord to be part of the 140. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us. It's our prayer in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.